So what can FEMA do? I'm going to tell you what we're, we are doing. Um, you know, I, talk, I talked about science as part of our credibility, too. So a lot of times after disasters, we send in a mitigation assessment team, as do uh, folks like the Weather Service, too, to learn. What do we learn? What did we learn from this, this, uh, these disasters? How can we help inform recovery, and how can we, uh, did our codes work? Should we change anything? So we had teams sent across four states uh, gathering this forensic information be before it perished, because it's perishable data. So that's one thing we did. Uh, we've also been supporting this outreach activities, a lot of training, not just say for Alabama, there's been some other activities through our regional office, uh, mentoring through Greensburg, Kansas, bringing folks in there to do those things. We've looked at our own grant program. You know, quite frankly, you know, disaster is an opportunity uh, and a teachable moment. I heard that this morning in uh, the sustainable um, community uh, session. But if we don't get the money out the door quick, we lose the opportunity. So how do we cut the red tape and the, the federal bureaucracy, and I'm a 31-year Fed, so I can say that. So we, we did. Uh, hazard mitigation grant team, along with our environmental and historic preservation team, figured out how to cut a 20 plus page form down to three pages and do a programmatic assessment of safe rooms so that the communities could uh, apply and get, get it through this into the process quicker. So those are things we're working on. Okay, finally I'm gonna um, Ed um, asked me to talk about some of our other priorities, and, I, and, and I'll talk about those, and I'll try to connect them to our, our strategic plan, because I believe, I believe through these lenses that, that it really focuses us on what we need to do. Um, we've got NFIP reform going on. You guys are aware of this. A lot of uh, interest. Um, we're we're uh, a nonpartisan uh, program. Everybody has wants a piece of us and wants to fix something. Uh, so we, we get a lot of love, as I say, uh, and we're, we're uh, doing a lot of reaction now to the House bill and, and some amendments that have been put on the floor, but the longer range plan is really looking uh, more holistically, and many of you have been involved in some of our stakeholder sessions and are following the NFIP reform closely. Um, stay tuned. I think it's re it, the process has been fascinating. We've been really um, uh, applauded for our very... Um, objective uh, process that we use. This speaks to credibility. And so we're putting forward the best uh, options we can in a very broad sense. Um, so that's coming along. We have our risk map program. I won't go into details of that, but if you want to talk ad nauseum about levees and maps and coastal mapping and all those issues, Roy writes here and Alex and I will continue this at cocktails. That's one of our favorite <laughs> subjects. Um, I want to talk a little bit quickly about sustainability partnerships, and two in particular that we're really pushing out on. One is one is with HUD. Uh, they have this uh, sustainability uh, grants, and so at the headquarters level, we talked about it, and we talked about it, and then we said, "Well, we're going to do something." So we are. We have five pilot programs uh, that we're working from with regional offices, FEMA regional offices, and HUD regional offices to see if we can't get boots on the ground and look at how we can make our grants, uh, you know, align our grants and our planning to be more effective. Um, it, it, that's Silver Jackets. It's another grassroots, uh, on the ground way to do things. And, and um, so that really is part of that partnering. And then um, a, a, another big deal this year, and Roy Rice uh, leading that for the mitigation piece, is the Presidential Policy Directive on Preparedness. And just so you know, um, the cycle's changed. It's not preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation. Preparedness is uh, protection, prevention, response, recovery, and mitigation. So there's, there's five frameworks. Uh, uh, hopefully they're all going to be stitched together in the end and, and some coherent uh, fashion. But in the meantime, we're, we're kind of moving forward with pieces and, and leading that. And so there's some opportunities there, and I'll, and I'll just read uh, what came, the definition of mitigation, just for your interest, from PPDA. And mitigation refers to 
the capabilities necessary to reduce loss of life and property by lessening the impact of disasters. Mitigation capabilities include, but are not limited to, community-wide risk reduction projects, efforts to improve the resilience of critical infrastructure and key resource lifelines, risk reduction for specific vulnerabilities from natural hazards or acts of terrorism, <coughs> and initiatives to reduce for future risk after a disaster has occurred. A lot of work. <laughs> So there's some, there's some deadlines that we're working on. Uh, we're looking towards these partnerships to really get, get um, the right stakeholders in the room to, to guide that. So stay tuned for that, and Cocktails and Lori later can answer more questions. So I'm going to tell another story. This is a story of flooding. Uh, honestly, I think it's a success story. This is the Mississippi River flooding this year. The floods were... Some would say in some places, bigger than the 27 flood, bigger than the 37 flood, bigger than the 93 flood. A lot of nothing happened, folks. Not much happened. I'm, and I don't take that away from those that were impacted. But considering the magnitude of the flood, a lot of things went right. And you have to ask yourself why, you know. Was it all the mitigation measures we've put in since 1993? I think that contributed. Was it the, the fabulous operation by the Corps, and kudos to, to General Walsh and the whole team, it was operated as a system the way that the system was designed to operate, and, and it was no small feat. So kudos to them. Kudos to NOAA. We had a seasonal forecast that has been spot on, and we went out ahead. All the agencies had an opportunity to get out ahead of it and be prepared and to prepare communities. Uh, of course, we're the villain for going out to the community and saying you should buy insurance and, uh, because then it looks like we're just closing the debt on the, you know, our, our insurance um, program. But nonetheless, and people still didn't listen. So that, that's another part of the story. But long story short, USDA, SBA, everybody has been, the federal family was out there, the local communities were out there. People were preparing. And, and, I, and I would have to say, it went, it went pretty well. But, but now we got Missouri River flooding. And some of the clips now are, why not, North Dakota. So 4,000 plus homes damaged by flooding. You know how many insurance policies we have out there? Less than 400. And uh, so in 2000 we remapped because there was a new flood protection works that provided the 100 year flood protection. And people decided they didn't need flood insurance anymore because they weren't in the special flood hazard area. So they dropped their insurance. So, folks, this is where I need the Leslies and the communicators out there. And, and so why, why didn't it work? And that question was actually asked this morning in the sustainability uh, session. And here, here's, here's my, my three things, I think. So what's going wrong here? Well, first of all, I think everybody's in denial. No one wants to believe that their house is going to flood. You know, I, I use my own brother as an example lives on the Wolf River Basin in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, um, you know, you, you, half a mile to the top bank of the, the uh, Wolf River, he rides his bike along it every day, exercising or fishing in the little uh, um, pond upstream. I said, Martin, you have flood insurance? I asked him that a year. No, nah, yeah, yeah, I'll get it, yeah, yeah. He calls me uh, uh, while the, flood, uh, the river's rising and he's seen water, you know, across the street in his neighbor's backyard and is now freaking out. I said, you got flood insurance, don't you? Um, well, no. And so I don't know if he bought it or not. I said, you may as well buy it now. You'll have it till next year. But I, I would kind of bet he doesn't have it. So we're denial. We just don't think it's going to happen to us. We just don't believe that anything bad can happen to us. Okay. Come on, folks. Second one is a false sense of security. Uh, so we build this fabulous infrastructure, and for those of us that built it and operated and maintain it, we know there's a res residual risk behind it. Yet we want to believe that the federal government or whoever's maintaining that levy is taking care of us. So we just we just believe it's going to 
work so we don't prepare prepare and then I, I think uh, this goes back to the enhancing credibility piece we're not a trusted source of information uh, like I said we go out and we try to sell uh, flood insurance and it's oh FEMA's just trying to you know balance the, their, their debt or their, there's some reason they don't want to believe us and I'm, I'm not sure why that's why a third party telling our message is always a better one so in closing I think that's why these partnerships are great I applaud you as the mighty mitigators, and I think we have some opportunity in the Mitigation Alliance that's, that's uh, been formed. And I always say that it's really the Tom Sawyer approach, uh, and that is that it takes everybody to, to paint the mitigation fence. And so I'm looking to all of you to help us do that and continue the good things you do. And I will stop there. Thank you.